Today is Palm Sunday, which signals that we are entering into holy space in history. This is the week in salvation history that's really the most important week, because this is the week that leads up to the cross and to the empty tomb. I encourage you to spend some time this week thinking about the events in, on the calendar of this week. Think about Thursday, Thursday night, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. We celebrated that last week. And he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane as the burden of sin was being pressed upon him. It was so intense that he sweat drops of blood as he was wrestling with the assignment of the cross. And then on Friday, take some time to think about it. It's a different time zone, but think about it in our time zone. It was 9 o'clock in the morning when he was crucified and 3 o'clock in the afternoon when he breathed his last on the cross. And then he was buried, put in the tomb. And very early, it says, on Sunday morning, he came out of that tomb. And boy, are we going to celebrate next week. It's Easter. Speaking of very early... The first service is seven, and uh, <clears throat> we're going to consider that a sunrise service, because it will be. So if you like to get up early and come to that, that'd be awesome. If you like sleeping in, have brunch, come at 12. Those are going to be probably the least attended times, seven and 12, and it would really help if some people would say, I'm just going to go to one of those times. Unless you have a friend you're bringing, then let them decide what time they want to come, and I hope that you will invite somebody to come with you. Well, today we conclude a six-week series entitled Worship Is, and we've talked about how worship is a verb, a prayer, costly, a discipline, a celebration, and today, worship is a way of life. True worship goes beyond Sunday. And if you want to worship God in a way that is holy and pleasing to Him, that it involves your whole life your everyday life, and he's the one that told us that. We're going to focus primarily on two verses as we wrap up this series, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, the Apostle Paul writing, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true, look at these words, True and proper worship. This series is about worship, so we should not avoid this verse because here God tells us what true and proper worship is. He goes on in the next verse to say, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think I'm getting some feedback there. <clears throat> do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Today, I just want to point out to you what I find to be four characteristics of true worship in the verses we just read. Number one, true worship is responding appropriately to the gospel. Verse one begins, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Now, I always encourage Bible students, when you see the word therefore, what are you to ask? What is it? Therefore. Because it's not a throwaway word. It's a very important word. It's a hinge word. It's a transition word. It provides the vital connection between theory and practice, between doctrine and duty, between knowledge and action. You can't have one without the other. One of my favorite teachers at Denver Seminary, when I was a student there, he said, Every time you sit down to prayerfully write a sermon, he said, you should, you should ask yourself this question. What do I want people to know? And what do I want to encourage them to do? And, you know, it's not enough to just have one and not the other. And that's what Paul does. And, and this, is a, this is his pattern. If you look through his writings, I could show you examples in Ephesians and in Galatians and 1 Thessalonians and other places uh, where he... Colossians, where he spends the first part, sometimes it's half and half, he spends the first part stressing what he wants those reading and listening to know, and then based on that knowledge, how he wants them to react and what he wants them to do. Jesus also 
stress the importance of following uh, action, following knowledge when he said in uh, John 13, 17, now that you know these things, he said, you're blessed if you do them. And that's how Paul's pattern is. And, and, and so he, he always presents the gospel first, and then there's a transition often, transition word, therefore, to encourage practical living in response to the gospel. And what happens is if we disconnect theory and practice, heresy results. Focusing on one or the other always leads to error if, if you're only focused on one and not the other. And, and, and also getting the order wrong is deadly. Notice Paul never talks about what we should do until he first presents what has been done. The order is essential. Grace first. Grace first. He says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, not in view of the coming judgment, not in view of the law's commands, not in view of trying to make sure you don't lose your salvation. No. The New Testament calls us to obedience and holiness, but it is always set in the context of responding to God's grace and mercy revealed at the cross. The phrase, in view of God's mercy, really is a summary of all that's been presented in the first 11 chapters of, of Romans. Romans is such a rich presentation of the gospel. So what he's saying is, in view of what I've already written, in view of the gospel, in view of the cross, in view of God's love and grace poured out through the finished perfect work of Jesus, in view of all that, responding with heartfelt appreciation, not under compulsion, not under the law, not under fear, not under guilt, not because of insecurity, but because of love. In view of God's mercy, let's worship the Lord with our lives. Not in order to be accepted by God, but because we are secure forever as his much-loved adopted children. As I love to say, working from victory, not toward victory. His victory is our security. Amen? So I want you to see first off, and you're likely to hear this message every week at Grace Place because we're centered in the gospel. But I want you to see first off that true worship is a re an appropriate response to the gospel. Second, present, it, it is presenting my body as an offering to God. This is true worship according to the last part of verse 1. It says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So what does that mean? What does it mean to offer our bodies as an offering to God. I think we'd all <clears throat> admit that our bodies can be an instrument for evil or for good. And pretty much every one of us in this fallen, broken world trains our bodies at an early age before we're converted to respond naturally and gladly to selfishness and sin. That's easy for us to do. But after we're born again, we receive a new, a new spirit, a, a new uh, inner control center of our being that enables us to commune with God. And from that day on, the spirit desires to do good and to please God, even though the flesh or the body fights back sometimes because of its old habits and inclinations. In fact, in the heart of Romans, if you want to go back and read Romans 6 through 8, that whole three chapters there is talking about this issue. Sometimes we feel like there's an inner war going on. And it's a struggle between the spirit and the body. It's described in chapter 7 of Romans. It says, Paul says there, sometimes I want what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. And we, we can all relate to that. But in chapter 6 of Romans, we're told that Christ has released us. If we've given our lives to him, he has released us from sin as a controlling slave master. It's still around, unfortunately, but now we can choose to turn and fight it as an enemy in a way we couldn't do before the Holy Spirit of God came into our lives. And chapter 8 of Romans informs us that the Holy Spirit is given as a helper so that we can start to retrain our body with new habits, as the text says, putting to, de to death the deeds of the body, the misdeeds of the body, it says, putting to death the misdeeds of the body. Now, <clears throat> we need to understand that when Paul wrote this, the philosophy that had been established by the famous Greek philosophers and was generally accepted by many thinking people in Paul's day, taught something very different from what the Apostle Paul taught. They taught that the body was hopelessly evil, that it was just a temporary prison for the soul, 
The soul was good. The body was evil. The best thing the soul could do is someday escape the, the body. Uh, and, and, but yeah, that's not what Paul taught, though. Paul taught that our bodies are actually intended by God to be temples of the Holy Spirit. Uh, our bodies aren't bad. The Bible tells us to take care of our bodies and to use our bodies to serve and please the Lord. And, and the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, understood that we are whole beings, body, soul, and spirit. Look how he closed his letter to the Thessalonians in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. He says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. That is sanctify. It's, a, it's an ongoing process of what God wants to do in our lives to make us less like our old self and more like Jesus. He said, may he sanctify you through and through. Now, notice this. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. And so the spiritual transformation involves our whole being, spirit, soul, and body. And, and so as we go back to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul encourages us to worship God by presenting our bodies as offerings. I like the way the message paraphrase puts it. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. I think that's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, offer your bodies all week long as worship to God. Your tongue, your, your ears, your eyes, your hands, your feet, your whole being. Use your body to serve and honor God, and that is true worship. Now, why does it say offer your bodies as, as living sacrifices? Why, why does it use those words? Well, this, this is language meant to contrast the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and how worship was different in both. In Old Testament times, people worshiped the Lord by bringing offerings to the temple to sacrifice. And there were many different sacrifices, but they basically two major sacrifices, one leading to reconciliation, and that was called a sin offering, and the other was more about responding with celebration. That was called a thank offering. Now, the sin offering was pointing forward to the cross. It prefigured the cross. Christ, the ultimate lamb of God. We're just saying worthy is the lamb. He was the ultimate lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so when he died once for all, there is no longer a need for sin offerings ever. He died once for all and it was finished and it was perfect. Amen? Amen. But a thank offering is still appropriate. Uh, that's just responding to what he's done for us and saying thank you and celebrating. And that's the kind of sacrifice that we offer in the new covenant. No longer a dead sacrifice, but a living one. No longer an animal sacrifice, but you and me. We bring ourselves as an offering to the Lord. Now notice the text says this is holy and pleasing. It's a holy and pleasing way to worship the Lord. I note that because not all worship is holy and pleasing to God. And he talks about that several places in the Old Testament where people got into the habit of just going through the routine. And he actually says in one place, your sacrifices are making me sick and tired because you're in, you're in defiant disobedience and your heart isn't in it. You're just going through a meaningless ritual. And that can still be true today. And I should recognize that God is not honored by my worship just because I come to church or sing a song or raise my hand or give 10% of my income to his work through the church. If my lifestyle through Monday through Saturday is mainly self-worship, then he says that makes him, me sick if, you, if I'm just looking at fake worship on Sunday. Amen. So we're looking for how can our worship be holy and pleasing to the Lord and, and don't misunderstand me, God is not looking for perfect worshipers because they do not exist, but he is looking for people with honest hearts, people who are willing to surrender to him and get their right hearts right before him. He's looking for humble worshipers who come before him with repentance, not resisting his will, but submitting to his will. And, and realigning with him in worship. He, he's looking for people who are interested in worshiping, worshiping him all week long, not just one day a week. Worshiping him in spirit and truth. And this is true worship. We're just breaking down these two verses in Romans 
12, verses 1 and 2. And, and we're seeing that true worship is first responding appropriately to the gospel. Second, presenting my body as an offering to God. And third, refusing the mold of this world. Verse 2, the first part, do not conform to the pattern of this world. You see, there are only two value systems, and they're both des described in these verses. There is this world and God's will. This world and God's will. And those two value systems are constantly in direct collision with each other. Each of those value systems gives a different answer to any key question of life that you might raise, such as, what is my purpose? What is the definition of greatness? What is the place of ambition in my life? How should I use my sexuality? Uh, what is the value of human life, both unborn and born? Uh, what does it mean to be, to be honest, and, and how is that important? How should I use my money? Uh, how important is commitment to my spouse, if, if married? Uh, wh what is the role of God and faith and church in my life, in my family, and, and so on? You know, every one of those fundamental questions is answered differently according to the value system of this world or God's will, and they're in direct collision. Now, <clears throat> when the text talks about this world, it's not talking about geographically, physically, the planet we live on. The Bible uses the word world three different ways in Scripture, so when you're reading, you've got to ask yourself, which usage is this now? For example, the first words of the Bible, in the beginning God created the world. That's talking about the earth. That's talking about this planet. And God cares about this planet. And he wants us to care about this planet. He's not going to blow it up someday. He's going to renew it someday, he tells us. The meek will inherit the earth. Jesus said when he returns, it will be the renewal of all things. The earth is the world. But then it can also be used to describe the people who live on the world, on live in this, in this world, on this earth. For example, uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's talking about people, the people of this world. And then it's sometimes it's used to describe what the Bible calls this present age. For example, it, or John tells us, do not love the world or the things of the, in the world. Do not love the world. Well, God so loved the world. Well, this is a different usage of that word. This verse that we're t talking about when it says you can be conformed to this world or you can be transformed towards God's will, it's talking about this present age. It's talking about the system of, of this world, which is contrary to God's system. You see, Christians are living, once we give our lives to the Lord, we enter into his kingdom, and we're now living in overlapping eras. Since the cross until the second coming of Jesus, we live in an overlapping era, era as dual citizens. You see, we live in this present evil age, which will come to an end someday. But through faith in Christ, we've actually entered into God's eternal kingdom. And we're already tasting of the coming age, which is eternal. And so, in a sense, we live as dual citizens. And that means we live with constant tension also. We have to. We've got to maintain this tension. And a lot of times we don't like that. We like to go to extremes so that we can not be in tension, but, but that gets us in trouble. You see, if we try to completely withdraw from this world, we'll be of no good for advancing God's kingdom. Jesus said his disciples are to be salt and light. What did he mean by that? Salt gets out of the salt shaker. If it doesn't, it's of no value. When it gets out of the salt shaker, it can add flavor, right? And, and light, if it's covered up, Jesus says, it's of no value. And you need to get that cover off so it can dispel darkness and shine. You can't go hide in a monastery and be effective for the kingdom of God. You can't always keep your kids sheltered. It, it, how, how can you be salt and light in the world if you only have Christian friends and only talk Christianese that no one understands? Do you know that you can become so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. <laughs> so we don't want to go to that extreme. On the other hand, you can't hope to be salty for God and shine his light if you totally embrace the world. If there's no difference between you and pagans except that you go to church once a week, 
How are you going to make an influence? How are you going to make a difference and have an influence for, for Jesus in the world? How are you going to impact people with his transforming grace and so that they can maybe be exposed to the gospel themselves through you? Jesus said, if salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing. He said, you might as well just throw it out and use it as road base. Because salt is intended to add distinct flavor and light is intended to dispel darkness around us. So, so we got to live with this tension. And, and that's what th- uh, the Bible teaches us when it says that we are to be in the world but not of the world. It's a healthy tension that we maintain as followers of Jesus in the world but not of the world. Now back in, in Romans 12 verse 2, I like the way one translation, J.B. Phillips translates it. He says, Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. You see, one way we worship God is by refusing the mold of the world, of this world, which is all of us are are being squeezed into its mold automatically unless we're greatly intentional to not let that happen. And, And every day is an issue. The text says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Notice the word pattern. We humans love patterns. It's just the way we're designed. We like models. We're conformist by nature. We like to think we're not. We like to think we're independent and pace setters. I do, you know, but I copy Pastor Hollis all the time. <laughs> We've got the same motorcycle and the same vehicle, but they're different colors. Or did you, yeah, I copied you, or did you copy me? I don't know. But that's just how we are as humans. I mean, look at look. Just think about think about when you're younger. You, you look at all the different groups that teenagers divide into in high school, you know, and and get identity from. And I don't know what they all are now, but there's always the popular crowd, and there's a bunch of other little circles. And some of those other circles, you know, they might be a little more marginalized, a little more offbeat, and and, and everyone in those groups likes to think they're being different, but really they're modeling. Uh, off of an image of different that they relate to, right? We're all, we're all looking for models and patterns. And, and so the issue is not whether you're going to pattern your life after something. The issue is, what is your pattern? Is it this world? I, I mean, the world holds up. Look who the world holds, it holds up as models. As we're, uh, you go through the checkout stand, you see them all on, on the covers of the magazines, and it's usually celebrities and movie and TV stars and musicians and athletes and the rich and the famous, and, and that's the model of what everyone strives to be. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could be like that? And the vast majority, not all, but the vast majority of those celebrities are pursuing self-centered, hedonistic lifestyles filled with glitter and excess, but that doesn't make them happy. So many stories can be told where people seem like they had everything from the world standpoint, but just because someone is smiling on the cover of a magazine or, you know, in a drunken haze leaving a club in the wee hours of the morning doesn't mean there's happiness. The real question is not whether we will model our life after a pattern, but what pattern? Will it be this world or will it be God's will? You see, true worship is responding appropriately to the gospel, first off. It's presenting my whole life as an offering to God, and it's refusing the mold of this world. And here's how we do that. Number four, true worship is being transformed toward God's will. You see, you're either going to be conformed to the world, and that can happen very automatically, or you're going to be transformed towards God's will, and that takes great intentionality. The text says, here's how it happens, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's the goal, God's will. Every follower of Jesus, that's their goal. I want God's will to be more important than this world in my life. That's a model or pattern for our life. And a lot of times people, I've done this too, I, always, I hear this a lot. A lot of times people, they talk a lot about God's will as, as though it's something they don't know. Oh, I need to know God's will about this or that decision or choice. I, need to, I know you need to know God's will. Should I buy this car? Should I date or marry this person? Should I take this job? Should I buy this house? And so on. 
I do think it's a good thing to ask God for wisdom when you're making decisions and to pray for perspective, to pray for for peace and, you know, and open closed doors and all that. But really, as you read the Bible, it says very little about knowing God's will for the future. But it has a whole lot to say about obeying God's will today, about God's will that you already know. You see, that's where the focus of Scripture is. It, it's about focusing on what we already know from His Word. He's given us His book to teach us what his will is. And so rather worrying about the future and what we don't know, there's a, we need to focus as believers on what we do know, which is his will, his moral will. You see, there's a difference between his sovereign will and his moral will. These are two different things. And generally speaking, God does not reveal his sovereign will of, the, of what's coming ahead. Occasionally he does. There's examples of that. But generally, we only know it looking backward. And we're like, oh, okay, I see how God was working there. Oh, yeah, 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 I see what God's been doing. And so our focus primarily is not on his sovereign will that we trust, that he's in charge and he reigns and he's in control, but our focus should be on his moral will that he has already revealed to us in his book, in his scriptures. Now, this text talks about being transformed toward God's will. And the word transformed in the Greek is metamorpho. I try to stay away from telling you Greek words unless it's something pretty interesting. And I find this one pretty interesting because you can already hear the English word in there, can't you? Metamorpho. We get our English word metamorphosis from that. And that's a word where we usually think of using that word when we're describing something that gradually evolved into something else, like a caterpillar becomes a butterfly or a tadpole becomes a, f- a frog. And today, with digital technology, there's a lot of morphing that you can see go on, just the transformation digitally. Like, I, I, in fact, I found out there is an app that you can put on your computer, watch this, and you can morph stuff. You just go in there, let, watch that cat on the right and what happens to him. All of a sudden, Kind of cool. You morph people. Kind of creepy. It'd be nice if you could morph all cats into dogs. <laughs> morph, morph, morph cars. Morph colors. All kinds of morph in action. You can even morph George Bush into Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> so you, you know what this word means. Now we're together on what morphing is. Listen, the Lord wants to morph your character. That's the biblical word used here. Transform, it's, 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 it's metamorpho. He wants to morph your character more and more toward his will. It's, it's a gradual change from the inside out, and it takes time, and it takes constant cooperation with the Spirit for it to happen. One of the ways we worship God, this text tells us, is by allowing him to do this gradual, transforming, character transformation work in us. And so that over time, we become less like our old self and more like our new self. We become more loving, more joyful, basically the fruit of the Spirit. We did a series on that last summer, and that's just a description of of the what Jesus' character looks like and what our character will start to look like if we're cooperating with the Holy Spirit in our life, more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, more kind, more faithful, more gentle, more self-controlled. Who doesn't want to be around people like that, right? And that's not natural for us, but that is what God wants to do supernaturally in us. And so that when we get Toward the end of our journey, we're not just grouchy old grumps, but we're nicer than we've ever been because we love Jesus, and you can see that evidence is in our countenance and in our way we treat each other. We're more spiritually mature. We're more like Jesus. God intends you to be conformed to the image of His Son, He says. How does that happen? Only one way. Our text says, be transformed by, read it with me, the renewing of your mind. This is the only way it happens. I like the way uh, that the, NI, the, the New Living Translation, I usually quote from the 
New International Version, but the New Living Translation reads, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And that's really what the renewing of the mind is. It's, it's letting God change the way you think, learning to think ac according to God's value system rather than the world's. And this work is done by God's Spirit, and the, the, the number one tool the Spirit uses is His Word, the Bible. The renewing of your mind is an ongoing process. And if you really want your life molded more and more after God's will, then you can't just rely on weekly teaching. This is vitally important, what we're doing here together. This is, this is an important spiritual discipline to gather, to hear God's word taught. He tells us that in his word. But it's not enough to really have our mind renewed. It has to be something that is of value and importance to us every day. To be transformed by the renewing of the, re of the mind re requires regular, preferably daily, attention. We talk about time alone every day with God. It can be even just a few minutes, but it's still, it's vital in order for this transformation to happen. And, and it looks different at, on different days for different people. We're all wired different. It might be taking a walk in nature and, and lifting your, your mind to God in prayer might be when you listen to worship music while you're driving your car and you, you turn it into worship, into prayer. It might be when you're, you're reading a scripture passage. Maybe you're, you're using a Bible plan where you have a passage each, each day to read that you can pray about and apply it to your life. You might use a journal. You might listen to scripture on your app. You might uh, read a book or listen to a book by a Christian author who makes you want to be closer to the Lord. There are so many different ways, but it takes intentionality. And so I encourage you to evaluate your life and to ask, where and how am I budgeting my time and space so that God has permission to renew my mind? What am I intentionally doing regular, regularly uh, 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 so that my thinking is more influenced by God's will than this world? Because, uh, man, if you're like me, it's so easy to get so distracted and, and run down so many rabbit trails and get so, and get so into what's going on in the world. If you don't have a plan, then maybe it's time to make one or to restart, or to refresh. I, for me, trying new things from time to time when, when whatever I've been doing kind of starts to feel stale is helpful. For example, uh, Celine and I have been reading this devotional for a couple months, and we took a staff through it also here at Grace Place. And in, in these devotional segments, uh, it recommends that you take two minutes of silence at the beginning and the end. And that, that feels kind of weird at first. Um, in fact, I, I set a timer on my phone so I'm not distracted looking at my phone. And the idea is not just to think about the day and make a mental list of everything that needs to get done, which is easy to do, but to idle down the RPMs and try to listen for God, His still small voice. Not even to rattle off a lengthy prayer, but to just say, God, I want to acknowledge you. I want to know you. I want to be with you. And I've, uh, that's something new that we've been doing and, and actually found that to be helpful at this stretch. But, but what is it for you? How, how, how much time do you dedicate just to God and building your relationship with Jesus? It's something to be thoughtful and to reflect on because we are influenced by those we spend time with and what we spend time doing. And so it is so important that we have dedicated time for strengthening our relationship with Jesus. And important to realize that, you know what? The rest of our time is worship too. It's not just when we read our Bible or go to church, as important as those disciplines are. Our thoughts are, can lift to God if we're intentional about it during in every conversation and in every drive and in every aspect of work and play. And all of that can be turned to worship. It's just like, you know, our, our time is just like our money. Uh, I, my wife and I, systematically, we put at least 10% of our income into an investment in God's kingdom through the local church every pay period. But the rest of our money 
is also God's to be managed. We're, I, I, I'm worshiping him the way I manage the rest of my money, not just the money I give. And so it is with time to carve out prime time for God and to continue to be conscious of him through the day, worshiping him, seeing all of life as worship. That's the goal. True worship goes beyond Sunday. Worship is a way of life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for creating us the way you have, for loving us, and for designing us to worship. We're so prone to worship the wrong things. Forgive us for that. Forgive us for where we wander. Forgive us for getting so distracted by the world. Forgive me for that. And may we truly learn more consistently to take our everyday, ordinary life, our sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before you as an offering. Amen.